Today, I have the pleasure of hosting North Vancouver's very own Keith Newmeyer. Keith is an industry luminary who has navigated the world of finance, business development, and mining since 1984, with roles in senior management, directorships, and the founding of First Quantum Minerals, Keith's entrepreneurial journey has been nothing short of remarkable. In 2002, he founded First Majestic Silver Corp, a move that defied market trends. Keith's visionary gamble on silver, when it was overlooked by many, led to First Majestic's phenomenal growth. Under his leadership, it has evolved into a $1.4 billion market cap company. Asking about his role models, Newmar notes his early fascination with Howard Hughes, who hit out in Vancouver when Newmar was 12 years old. Join us for a captivating conversation as we discuss his relentless pursuit of success early in his life, how he transformed desolate mines into billion dollar empires, and the entrepreneurial wisdom that guided him along the way. Keith, thanks for being on Coastal Front. Well, great, Andrew, and uh, thanks for the invite. I know you and I have spoken quite a lot about getting this podcast put together and it's been months and months in the waiting and uh, finally great to sit, sit here with you and have a chat. Yeah, agreed. Okay, Keith, for those uh, listeners and viewers who aren't uh, familiar with your name or maybe even um, First Majestic Silver, maybe you could start with your company so that people, and a bit of your history, first with First Quantum, Snowline Gold. So give, give the listeners and viewers a bit of history so that they know who we're talking to and what company we're talking about here. Sure. Well, um, <laughs> you know, I don't want to bore people too much to death, but um, uh, I was born in Van North Vancouver, uh, you know, in 1960 and the year, year of the rat. And, uh, um, uh, you know, grew up, uh, you know, just working my butt off. Uh, 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 you know, my mother brought up three boys and, uh, you know, they got uh, divorced when I was quite young. I never really grew up or really, really didn't get to know my father that well. So, you know, she, uh, you know, I was a single mom in, in North Vancouver and, you know, bringing up three boys was pretty unusual in the 60s. So I learned a lot of, you know, uh, lessons along the way. And, uh, you know, I think she was a great mentor for, for myself and my two brothers. And, um, uh, you know, off, I, 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 I always loved numbers. I was really good. I was just right from, you know, earlier times. I was just super good with math. And, you know, I would spend hours, you know, late at night, you know, uh, you know, uh, in bed, uh, you know, doing complicated math, you know, uh, uh, drills in my brain, you know, just because I just did that, right? And uh, kind of as crazy as a, you know, 10 or 11, 12-year-old boy. But anyways, that's what I did. And um, um, so as uh, I, I got older, I was fell, fell in love with finances. And uh, but I really didn't know a lot about finances. I didn't really have a mentor. Um, you know, you mentioned Howard Hughes. You know, yeah. right? It's uh, interesting. You know, I read a lot about him and uh, not that I, you know, learned a lot of lessons, but I just, you know, understanding that, you know, you could actually go from nothing, uh, you know, to, to actually be successful was quite a unique phenomenon that, uh, you know, I paid attention to. And uh, um, I, I tried my effort in college, um, but it was like, you know, working midnight to eight o'clock in the morning and, and then going to college at nine and, you know, you leaving college at three and then going to bed and getting up at midnight again. I just, you know, it, that, that was What were you doing it. working at midnight to eight in the morning? I worked at Loomis. Okay. Yeah, uh, Loomis wow. in their, in their warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it was great, you know, good paying job and, but it was just, it was too much, you know, yeah. two, two years of doing that. I just said, this is not for me because I, I figured I'd be a lawyer or, or get into banking or something like that. And, uh, so anyways, I, 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 from there I got into the insurance business. Uh, as a, a farm underwriter of all things, uh, quite a cool industry, you know, travel out to Abbotsford and Chilliwack and go through all these, you know, farms out there, pig farms and, <laughs> you know, and, and I'd underwrite these farms and, you know, as a, an interesting really? experience. Um, and I, I, and I just was dropping resumes off at all the banks in town and, uh, you know, whoever would talk to me, whoever, whoever would hire me, um, you know, eventually in, in, uh, 1984, the Vancouver Stock Exchange hired me and, uh, so I was uh, on the floor. As a board marker. In this building. Yeah, exactly. This building. <laughs> Where we're yeah, filming yeah, today. Exactly. Yeah. I guess we'd been the third floor back then, if yeah. I remember correctly. What was your yeah. first job at the Stan Vancouver Stock Exchange? In board marker. Yeah. Board marker. Yeah. yeah. On the boards, running around, and uh, quite a unique experience because you can never, the funny thing is, you know, you can never turn around because if you turn around, then you'd, you would miss, you know, the quote, right? Because you've got, you know, 20, 30 guys yelling at you and you you have to recognize their voice. You go, Canaccord, House 35, right? 
you know, okay, that's Canaccord. Okay, I know that guy. You know, 50 bid, you know, from Canaccord, you put it up on the board, you put 35 there. And uh, if you fuck up, you know, they're going to, they're not going to be very happy. So <laughs> they, they start throwing stuff at you. So, <laughs> so it was a pretty good experience. I, I did that for about five years. And then Scotia uh, Bank hired me. Then um, I think Richards and Greenshields actually hired me first. Yeah. And then Scotia. And then I went all over to Middle, Middle, Middle New Orleans, Stodgell. Yeah. Came CIBC later. Anyways, I, I was on the floor the day of the crash, you know, um, October 18th, uh, 1987, I guess it was. Yeah. So three, and, uh, three years into your career in the yeah, financial industry. Yeah, yeah, and that was pretty fascinating. Um, uh, I, I made more money the day after the crash than I ever made up to my point in my career at that point. Really? Yeah, because I, I came in long. What did you do? I just bought a bunch of stuff and just came really? in long. The yeah. day after? The day after the crash, and everything just bounced. and yeah. So it wasn't, you know, in today's money term, yeah. it's not a lot. But yeah, but time. Then, it was a couple grand, you know, yeah. for a young guy to make. It was like, a, that was a lot of fun. Wow. So, um, yeah, so then I went off and um, had a couple of uh, interesting experiences. Um, I don't want to bore you but uh, uh, too much, but, you know, First Quantum was my first, you know, um, company that I really put together, like a big company. Uh, yeah. I put together smaller companies on the way. But uh, it was actually, um, it came from a beer company because I was financing a, uh, <laughs> a, a beer, because this is right when the Iron Curtain was falling. Okay. So, so we were trying to buy a brewery in St. Petersburg, Russia, of all places, you know. Really? I'm, you know, I'm still brand new in my career. And uh, so I'm running around town, you know, talking to brokers at Canaccord and Haywood and, you know, all the different guys that, who would ever listen to me, you know, to, to, to get some, some money from to finance this, uh, you know, purchase of this uh, uh, brewery in St. Petersburg. And the city council um, told us that we were the winning bid. So 13 million bucks, I remember, it's very specifically. And we had all the brochures and we had all the mock beer all made up. We're going to import Russian beer, you know, into Canada. You know, it's going to be a big thing, right? And we had these designers out of California that did this wonderful label. And then um, uh, I got a call from the lawyers and they say, hey, Keith, you got to come down downtown. Okay, fine. So, you know, I'll go downtown. They said, by the way, um, some oligarch got the brewery and you guys are done. And I said, what? You know, I just raised all this money. <laughs> You know, the stock is a buck, and I've got all my brothers and friends, relatives, you know, every person on the street that would listen to me, as I said, you know, uh, own this thing. And the thing collapses to 10 cents. I'm like, oh, my God, this is terrible. So uh, uh, so I rolled it back and called it uh, First Quantum Minerals after the uh, Quantum Leap um, TV series at the time. Really? That my That's where the name came from. Yeah, because yeah, it's <laughs> one, one of my favorite best, um, shows. and. And we couldn't get quantum resources. Uh, the lawyers, no, you can't do that. So they, it was actually the lawyer's idea to put the word first in front of it. Mm -hmm. So uh, so we had first quantum minerals. And yeah, then uh, 90, 1992 to 1994, I worked for a diamond company. Okay, but be, before you go any further, I'm just curious this, this, uh, com this uh, how first quantum came about. So, I mean, you went, you were trying to find, you were trying to, acquire a brewery in St. Petersburg, Russia. Yeah. Deal collapses, but you got all this money in this effectively shell that you roll back yeah, shell exactly. that, so that but then what was the mining asset that you you rolled in there or you purchased how would had that come about so clive newell who um uh was running a company called kensington resources he yeah. needed some he needed some help okay so the connection there was the same lawyer okay so he said oh you know you got to meet this clive character and uh, he's having some hard times the ceo just passed away he was a VPX, and they just put him on as president. So I said, okay, fine. No, so I'll go help him. So I spent two years uh, between 92 and 94 helping him out. Stock went to like four bucks, and because and, uh, this is right when, you know, that whole diamond, um, you know. Uh, yeah, craze was, going on, was yeah. going on. You know, you get a Kimberlite, and, you know, your stock is five bucks. Right. right? And uh, so anyways, it was all that hype that was around that. Canaccord was huge behind the diamond, diamond sector back then, as you probably know. Yeah. But um, but, but nevertheless, the... Uh, uh, and he says, hey, Keith, you're ready to do something together because this is amazing. And uh, I said, well, I got the shell, first quantum minerals right here. Why don't we do something? He said, okay, fine. So um, I was the president. I put him on as a director. And, and then one day oh, after pounding the road for or the pavement for two years, we just got a call out of London, England, and uh, a guy named Phil Pascal, who just passed away a couple of weeks ago, the chairman, uh, came into a fellow in the fellow's uh, office, a guy named Colin Bird. Uh, Lion Mining, and uh, Clive got the call and, you know, say, hey, this Phil guy just showed us, showed me this copper deal in 
Zambia, and you guys should fly over here and look at it. So, okay, fine, whatever. You know, we didn't think of copper. We surely didn't think about Africa. Like, there was no one in Africa back then. You know, and uh, uh, so we flew over there and learned a lot about <laughs> it and loved it. And we were the first investment in, in the copper belt in 35 years. And, really? Uh, built it from scratch. And this is the early 90s at this point? That was 95. Yeah. And we broke ground in um, uh, 97, and mm -hmm. we were in production by 98. Wow, that's and, a fast uh, turnaround. And I left the company in 2000. Um, uh, and, and at that point, we had 9,000 employees uh, the year I left. And uh, we did, I think, $138 million in U.S. in revenue that wow. year from zero. Wow. Yeah. So that's impressive. Pretty exciting. Okay, so that was first quantum, and then you moved into... So I, got, I dabbled in uh, the high-tech industry a little bit. And oh, yeah. The dot-com boom, and uh, I you know, probably lost more than I made, quite frankly. What was your, probably your, your biggest <laughs> fail, what was your biggest failure in that space? Nortel. I bought it on the way down, and um, yeah, I got kind of destroyed on that one. <laughs> right. It's probably, it's probably is still my largest loss. Really? I would think so. Yeah. yeah. It's kind yeah. of big. So anyways, I, I yeah. got through it. Yeah. So you you got you had yeah, a little and then then oh two yeah you know, we saw Ian Telfer and uh, you know the um, um, and then Frank Juster you know start to you know finance the resource sector back then in two thousand two and that was kind of a light that went on I said okay mm -hmm. well this has got to be the bottom these guys are now deploying capital this is the time to put something together yeah so you know coming from a copper company I was kind of like okay well where do I go and uh, you know gold was the natural because you know I, uh, you know gold's easy. Um, but I didn't want to just become another gold company. I wanted to become something unique. Yeah. And uh, I fell in love with the silver. Uh, I looked at it. To me, it was very similar to copper. Uh, supply demand fundamentals were amazing, in yeah. my view. Um, the metal was, you know, three bucks, you know, at the time, four bucks. You know, gold was, you know, two twenty or two fifty, something like that. Yeah. And uh, um, yeah, so I just loaded up on a bunch of juniors, Ken Ross. I bought a twenty five cents a share. Uh, a bunch of others. I was just loading up. And then I just parlayed, you know, my first quantum um, uh, profits and some of my other trading profits into first majestic silver. Okay. And I uh, hit the road hard. And uh, by 2000 and... So when did first majestic silver get launched effectively? Re well, really 2002. Okay. Um, we didn't get our first asset until four. Okay. Um, uh, you know, we're, I was buying some exploration assets just to kind of keep the company alive and you know, yeah. keep it trading. And then... Yeah. Uh, but with a vision to get it into production. Okay. Uh, and, and find that uh, And asset. you knew silver was going to be the space you wanted to be focused yeah. on? Oh, okay. for sure. Yeah. yeah. And what was your reason for that? I mean, other than being not wanting, other than not wanting to be a gold company, like was there, there must have been something, because there's lots of other metals you could have, you know, you could have gone back to copper, which is a space you already knew. Yeah. Why did you choose silver? You know, I just saw, you know, a friend of mine bought a, a cell phone for $5,000. Okay, and and, uh, and and this is how five thousand yeah. dollars and yeah. you know those Motorola flip yeah. phones. <laughs> right. I said, like, what the hell are you buying that for? And, and and I love computers. Yeah, and I, I was this guy that would uh, like I could personally take a computer apart. Yeah, take out all its boards and put it back together, and still would work. Really? So yeah, yeah. So I, I was really into technology, and I just loved that kind of stuff. So I said, geez, this is really the future. And uh, I said, silver is really the primary. So he, he had a $5,000 Motorola flip phone, and it somehow correlated with silver? How, and it, how, how did you put the connection together? Well, because, you know, it being the components. I, you know, I guess, yeah, just being, you know, interested in electronics, yeah. and technology. And you know, learn, silver's learn, in there. Learn, learning about it. Yeah. You know, copper came from a copper company. You know, I heard, you know, I, I, the copper story was very near and dear to me. Yeah. So the silver story was so easy. It just right. you know, it was natural. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the supply demand fundamentals for silver are, are much tighter than copper. Which we're going to get into. I want to talk about that in a few minutes. But okay, okay so so you, you got inspired by looking at your friend's $5,000 motor or a flip phone and other reasons that you just looked at silver. You saw that yeah. in computers. Yeah. And so you decided to start um, looking for assets. Now, uh, First Majestic's uh, um, largely all, almost all of your assets, I believe, are in Mexico. Is that correct? Correct, yeah. Okay. We have one development project in Nevada. In Nevada, okay. Mm -hmm. So did it start there going back to 2004? Was it always in Mexico? Always Mexico. Okay. And yeah. so what, I mean, Mexico, I guess, is well known for its silver production, but is was there a reason why you picked Mexico over other jurisdictions around the world? Well, silver. Yeah. Know, it's the largest silver producer in the world. So oh, is it? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. yeah. So yeah. I was attracted there automatically, but... Um, what does no, Mexico I, represent as far as global silver production? You know, they do about 200 million ounces of production. Yeah. So that would be about uh, 30 percent. 30 percent world supply. Really? Yeah. Wow. That's mostly primary as well. 
So like in Peru, for example, it'd be mostly polymetallic. Okay. Uh, you know, with lead and zinc and so on. Okay. Now you got Poland that's got, um, they've got the largest mine in the world. Yeah. So, um, and there, that, that would be, um, about the same, about 30%. Okay. I guess this is why when you go down to Mexico to any touristy town, you see silver shops all over the place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Do you remember where your first asset was in, in Mexico that you purchased for first? Yeah. The, the Majestic, first yeah. Majestic? I remember, you know, we, we drove by the highway. It's it it kind of funny because um, I, so first of all, I, you know, I, I put together the management team. Okay. Because that was key. Because, you know, I think management has to come before the assets. And then. Uh, you hear a lot of people talk about this in the mining space. Like I, I, when you listen to research analysts or you talk about um, mm -hmm. people who are in the industry and know it well, they often talk about management team. Yeah. What what defined like what what how, what was a, what was important for your management team, for you to, and your management team like how how did you well you know you can't have expats uh, so you need to have local talent okay and and uh, like you know um, uh, first quantum is quite a learning experience for me because you know you, you know Phil and his brother despite the fact they're white um, you know Phil was seven six and 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 his brother Matt was seven five and you know these guys were born and raised in Zimbabwe wow and and knew the knew that ins and outs of the Africa, the Copper Belt, you know, because they've lived there their entire lives. And uh, um, so, you know, and then Phil would always say, no, we can't. We always have to rely on local talent. So, okay. he, you know, and so that's a lesson learned. He, he, he wouldn't be flying in guys from the UK or Canada or, or wherever, right? He just used local talent because they're the guys, you know, and, and uh, you know, I remember, you know, or the, you know, one of our first mine, the bottom of Cuba, you know, there's a gate around this, this mine and and uh, so I'm I'm staring at this lineup of people. You know, it's 300 people just you know uh, lined up at the gate. And I say, Hey, Phil, like, what's going on here? Like, what are these? Doing? Oh yeah, we just when we have troubles in the gate, we get rid of the one and we bring the next one in. And uh, you know, and that, that's just the way it works, right? So okay. it is you know, quite interesting. You can't quite do that today. It was yeah. not exactly uh, uh, probably not the best protocol these days. But um, Mexico is it, very tribal as well, and uh, you got a lot of extremely talented mining people in Mexico. It is one of the most, probably the friendliest mining jurisdiction, I think, in the world. Right, uh, yeah. And a history there, that's probably why. That goes back, yeah, yeah. hundreds of years. And uh, the governments, you know, sure they're giving uh, the miners a little bit more challenge challenges today compared to, you know, what we would have got 20 years ago. Uh -huh. But still, you know, from a permitting perspective and a talent perspective, you need 300 people, you know, on your mine site tomorrow They'll be there, wow. no problem. Yeah, you know, you you know, you try to get three hundred worker mine workers in Idaho, right, or, or, or Nevada, or, <laughs> yeah. or, or, or British Ontario. Columbia, yeah, or you, anywhere. Yeah, forget it. You, yeah, you'll, you'll be, you know, waiting months and months, and you'll have to probably bust them up from right. all kinds of places around the world just yeah. to get them there. Um, and and uh, you know, a lot of mining executives get quite frustrated with that, and uh, uh, because they just can't get the people. Yeah. And if you do get them, they get paid a ridiculous amount of money. Right. Um, you know, an a, a, a underground mine worker in Mexico, you know, his base salary would be about 20, 30 grand, and then plus bonuses on top of that, maybe yeah. another 50. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, it's a decent, decent job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 50 grand for, you know. Yeah. In Mexico, that's a, that's a good income. Yeah. That's a very yeah. good income. Yeah. For a young guy in the yeah. underground. And, yeah. uh, uh, but by contrast, would you, would you be paying somebody in, in about 150 for that? Wow. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you Makes talked about permitting, time. permitting, uh, Keith, w like, can you give the listeners a, a kind of a concept of like what, what permitting would t take for two similar projects, one in Mexico and one in Nevada? <clears throat> yeah. Well, what's the turnaround time? You know, it depends on if you, if you own the land, uh, because a lot of forestry land in Nevada. Okay. Um, uh, so it's all government. It's basically Canada's version of crown land. Yeah. But, um, and it, that could take years and years and years just to get through that regulatory process in mexico it, no yeah, we're talking about yeah Mexico. yeah and in mexico yeah. by contrast oh, six months okay. six, six to twelve months yeah. yeah so very very mining friendly jurisdiction as you said yeah okay yeah. so we'll, i'll give you an example so, yeah. so too because you asked about when our first mine yeah so we we bought the lapria mine in in uh, i didn't tell the whole story but yeah. um uh in, in in january 2004 okay and we were in production by october of the same yeah. year? Yeah. That year, we produced 25,000 ounces of silver. Wow. Yeah. So today we're yeah, when I think of 25 like, million. So. Yeah. When I yeah. think of someone like um, John McConnell, Victoria Gold, who you know, is probably a common friend and also a guest on Coastal Front, mm -hmm. I mean, he's taken 
most of his you know adult life in developing his project up in the Yukon. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. uh, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. So how many how many um, producing mines do you have under First Majestic Silver today? Right now, there's three. There's three mines. Okay, so and at, what, at the peak we had seven. Okay, mines. And this is uh, we didn't have more production. Today we have more production. Okay, there's less mines. Okay, um, we we sh ended up shutting down. You know some of our smaller, you know, less profitable operations. I, I I'm not a huge fan of uh, producing concentrates, and I'm not sure if you know the difference between a dory bar versus concentrates. But you know, certain types of mill, you know, actually can produce a virtual end product. Okay, you know, just a block of metal, and really, uh, and yeah, and that's called dory bars, and that's what we produce. Okay, uh, uh, if you're like, um, and the reason why we shut down these other mines is because they're polymetallic mines. And they would produce a concentrate, which is a blend of all kinds of different metals just in this pile of black powder. And it's got to be shipped off to mostly Asia, um, Japan to, to lesser degrees, but yeah. usually Korea, uh, China. And they just melt it down under high heat and break it into different metal components. I see. It's, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a little bit uh, messy. Yeah. And it's very expensive. Mm -hmm. Energy costs are quite high. And mm. uh, no one wants to smelt from the backyard. Right. And all yeah, this of course. Stuff goes to Asia. Yeah. 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 Um, why don't we take a minute, Keith, to talk about the um, the global supply and demand of silver? Um, you mentioned earlier your friend's five thousand dollar flip phone. Flip phone um, when you first got inspired in two thousand four. What is silver use mainly used for? Silver mainly used for today globally. Yeah. Well. You've got two industries, um, the solar panel industry, pho pho photovoltaic cells, and you've got the electric car industry, who are both relatively new businesses. You know, they've okay. been around for a decade, let's call it. I know yeah. they've been around longer than that, but, you know, when they became commercial, uh, it's only really been about 10 years. And those two industries consume 30% of world supply of silver right now. And those They consume 30%? Yeah, just those two industries. So, wow, and then that, and and yeah, you go back. But, but these industries are, as you pointed out, very new. So if yeah. you uh, if you go back, and maybe you're already asking answering my question, but if you go back, see, even just as early as 20 years ago, where there was really no, uh, there was no electric cars for sure, and there was yeah. very little um, solar production. What was silver being used for? Well, you have to go back store further. value. You have to go back further. So okay, you, sure. If you go back pre 60s, yeah, uh, most silver was used in coinage. Okay, right? and then uh, right. governments owned it. Uh, and then, then, then photography, you know, was, was started to get big as well. So your your, your thirty five millimeter film, yeah, you know, or even your X rays in, in hospitals, okay, you know, they consume a lot of silver. Those technologies disappeared, um, and now everything's electronic, so we know, right? Um, and and the coinage business disappeared, right? So so from basically the seventies throughout all all the way right through the eighties into the nineties, there was an enormous amount of silver on the surface of the earth. I see. Because there was just nowhere to use it. I um, see. And and because uh, governments were getting production was there, but demand had continued yeah, to decline. Photography was dropping. Yeah. All that stuff. So there was a, a, the, the numbers I've seen is about five billion ounces of silver that was sitting on the Earth's surface around that time frame, mid '80s to late '80s. Wow. And and uh, then as computers and cell phones started to get developed, and then other technologies started to to kick in, um, all that silver started to get absorbed. Now, we estimate there's about 1 billion ounces of silver sitting on the Earth's surface today. So in the last, Untouched? Like, meaning that it's... In, a, in commercial in, bars. Yeah, okay. Yeah. It's in vaults, you know, government vaults or, or, or ETFs. Yeah. Because, you know, you have, um, you know, BlackRock or, you know, whomever, right? Right. Um, so, but we estimate it's somewhere around a billion ounces. It could be okay. a little bit more than that. Um, but who knows? Because it's all very secretive and... Right. Um, uh, but the world production of silver is 850 million, actually about 830 million ounces this year. Okay. Um, the Silver Institute says that 2023 production is 6% lower than 2022. Now, I've not seen the final numbers yet, but yeah. uh, that's the number they bantied around. Yeah. So, um, but if you go back, uh, we hit peak silver in 2016 at 880 million ounces. And we're at 830 right now? 830 right okay. now. Okay. It's just basically flatlined. Okay. And uh, during COVID, we dropped to 780. Right. So, uh, uh, but it's now popped up back over 800. And there's no big mines anywhere coming online. Okay. And grades are dropping. When you know, you know, you know we're yeah. just talking to other mining executives. You know, our grades are dropping around the world. Yeah. It doesn't matter what metal, gold, right. copper, yeah. you know, because all the 
juicy, juicy stuff, stuff was yeah, found. It's gone. Yeah, so the last hundred years. Harder and harder. And, uh, yeah. So grades are dropping, costs are going up, and yeah. there's just no big investments yeah. going into mining. And, yeah. uh, and silver is a very unusual metal. It's not easy to find. And it's not easy to produce. Okay. Like, you know, uh, gold, um, you know, as you probably know, we, we trade about 85 to 1 gold okay. and silver. Yeah. And uh, so for every one ounce of silver that's that trades, you know, it's a one eighty fifth of the price of, of gold. Mm -hmm. But yet we're mining 7 to 1. So for every one ounce of silver being mined worldwide, there's only 7 ounce or for whenever... One ounce of gold, gold being mined. There's only seven ounces of silver being silver, produced. Silver being produced. So what you're saying effectively is gold production is far outpacing silver production. Yeah. So that's the production side, and it sounds like what you're saying, what you kind of paint the, the picture you're painting is that we're at a flat line here from a gold uh, silver production. production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But what about the demand side? Because you've highlighted the fact that it, the the demand declined in in camera uh, in fo photo usage as well as x-rays but then it got replaced with the computer and phone technology yeah but now you've mentioned photo those cells. and now you've got photo cells and now you've got evs which are huge mm -hmm. so i gotta assume is it fair to say that demand is rising yeah demand last year was 1.2 billion ounces and demand and we're only this producing, year yeah it will be 1.4 billion ounces so we're well there's we're a producing, huge gap there 1.2 1.4 yeah, it's 400, 400 million now. It's the largest so, ever deficit was last year. Is it, It's going to be bigger this I'm, year. I'm going to simplify this. If if you have that much of a gap, about a sounds to me you're saying about a two hundred million dollar, uh, two hundred million ounce gap between demand and production. About, close and to four hundred. Yeah. Okay, four hundred. Mm -hmm. And there's around a billion of sort of reserves sitting around the world. I'm assuming that four hundred four hundred million ounce difference has got to come out of those reserves. You know, it's a good question because uh, I remember, you know, uh, a famous photograph of Putin years ago. You know, he's uh, in his gold vaults in, in uh, wherever in Russia they keep their gold. Who knows? Yeah. But you know, there, there is a quite a probably in Switzerland. <laughs> probably not. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, he wouldn't do a photo op if it was probably in Switzerland. <laughs> but uh, but I, I, against the back wall, you yeah. see all these pallets of silver. Really? Yeah. And so so they have fun to find that picture. Yeah, it's, it's around because uh, it was on Twitter and I, I, I saw it yeah. a couple of years ago. But anyways, um, so obviously they have silver. Mm -hmm. uh, they don't report it. They report their gold holdings as China does. And yeah. you know, we don't know if, you know, if they'll tell the truth either. Yeah, yeah. They're, if they're real or not. But um, nevertheless, they, um, but no one reports the silver numbers. Mm -hmm. So we don't know. So when we say there's a billion ounces of silver, we believe that's sitting on the surface of the earth. This is countable silver. Right. So this is where we know it is. It's in ETFs. It's sitting in uh, banks, hoards, J.P. Morgan. You know the different uh, banks that own silver. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. But other than that, mm. you know, outside of that, you know, what China owns, China doesn't export silver. Yeah. And China is the largest producer of silver, or actually after Mexico. So. Well, then, uh, what, if there's but, such, if there's a 400 million ounce gap, it seems like it's happening every year, and it's I suspect going to just it's growing. It's yeah. going to grow. That gap's going to widen. I mean, other than the price going higher, what's the uh, what's the long term solution to this gap? It's a good question. Um, uh, we'll have to uh, mine lower grades. Uh, you know, there there are you know some assets around the world that, that and we you know of course you know when when silver was fifty dollars an ounce a few years ago, you know of course we're getting you know a lineup of bankers are at our front door trying to get us to buy assets. Um, uh, but they're all low grade, you know, very marginable type assets. But um, you know, at fifty dollars an ounce, you, you could likely mine thirty, forty, fifty gram, you know, silver. Right. Um, uh, how long you could do it for, you know, is another question. So yeah. You, you you would need. But we're not at fifty right now. I know. Yeah. Where where are we at right now? Twenty three. Twenty twenty three. Yeah. And it's the end of twenty twenty three. Where were we at the beginning of the year? Um, it's been quite volatile. It's, you know, call it uh, 18 to 25. Yeah. has been the range for the last 12 months. Yeah. Okay. Um, but you know, you think of a, a ton of rock. Yeah. Right. So, you know, cause this is, you know, as a miner, this is obviously what we have to think of. So if you have, um, uh, 100 grams silver per ton, call it, you know, that's three ounces. Yeah. Call it, um, uh, so that's seventy-five dollar rock at current, or seventy dollar rock at current metal prices. Uh, it's going to take you probably between a hundred and one hundred and fifty dollars to get that rock out of the ground and process it. Okay, right. So you're going to be losing half your money, right? 
at right. 100, at 100 grams. Yeah. Right. So, hence the reason you started shutting down some of these mines in yeah. in, in Mexico. Just mm-hmm. the economics weren't there. That makes sense. Right. Sure, that's not an easy decision to make because it required you to not only shut down the mines. I'm assuming you're laying off a lot of people. Yeah, you know we've you know I've I've been in the business since you know eight, in night you know mid mid eighties. So you know I've hired and fired a lot of people in my career. Unfortunately, yeah, um, it's just part of the business. So uh, yeah, um, we shut down a mine just a, a year ago. Had to lay six hundred people off. Yeah, um, you know we we had uh, uh, and with with metal prices and and just the, the inflation. You know we had pretty you know, high inflation over the last couple of years with energy prices and manpower, labor costs going up the way they did. You know, we've had to make some serious cuts in our, our manpower. Yeah. We were at uh, 5,300 employees um, 18 months ago. We're now yeah. at 3,800. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, the way I see it is guys like you may have to lay those people off, but you got to, you had to hire them in the first place. And, you know, we yeah. need, we well, need more people like you, Keith, who are willing to take a risk and go out there and build a business that creates a mind to employ people in the first place. In fact, on that note, um, maybe you could talk for a minute about, you know, the kind of things that a mining company would do in a country like Mexico in a town where one of your mines are located. Because, you know, I think our, our listeners and viewers probably get this because most of them are generally, I think, corporate and, and mining friendly listeners and viewers. But for those who might not be and listening to this going, oh, this is just another, you know, Canadian mining guy out there, you know, exploiting the the people of Mexico, maybe you can speak to a question like that. Like, what what is a company like First Majestic doing locally in in a in a town like one of the towns that you're located in? Yeah, it's a great question. I think that um, people often don't understand really what a mining company does. Um, you know, and 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 you know, exploiting land and taking metal out of the ground, and you know, it it, it is looked at as a dirty industry. Um, but you know, I go back. To my earliest days, you know, uh, when I first started in this business, and the why I fell in love with mining, and uh, I didn't start off in mining. I, 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 um, I, I, I found my way into mining, and learned to really respect it because yeah. of the long-term wealth that it creates. Mm-hmm. You know, so you know, a mine goes into a small little town that is is no one is there for the most part. <clears throat> you have a discovery, and then you get your permits, which obviously are risky and takes time. So you know you're already probably in a hundred million minimum of your investment, and you probably already spent five to ten years of your life getting to that point. And then you're at the mercy of the governments to give you permits all along the way, and also your investors. You know you got to have to yeah. raise, raise this money from somewhere. Yeah. So you and you got to go, show them a return. You got to. There's only so many times you can go back to somebody, ask them for more of their money when you're not making them any return. Yeah. And mining is a long game. Yeah. Right. So, so, and, and often you know, you got twenty year paybacks, and then sometimes even longer than that. Yeah. So you know everyone has to be extremely uh, patient, uh, but once that mine is up and running, you know the wealth that it can create, because you know, and and the jobs that it can create. Yeah. And the education, you know, and uh, this is what gets me excited. And uh, you know, I go through these small towns, you know, and, and La Priya was a good example when I mentioned that as our first mine. That we bought. What was La Priya like in 2004 when you first went it through there? It was shut down. It was gone. So the mill was scrap metal. It was shut down in 19. So they had, they had an existing mill there previously. A small, scrap metal small, mill. Basically, yeah. It was it was 180 ton a day mill. Uh, needed a complete rebuilt. It was it was shut down in uh, 90, 99, I believe it was, or 98. Yeah. And uh, and we turned it back on in 2004. So this thing was rusting away for six years and. Uh, a couple of real estate brother, real estate developers uh, who, who bought it from the government, um, you know, years before and trying to get it up and running, couldn't. So, you know, with me and our, our team and our money, we we're able to get that up and running. But that town had maybe easily less than 100 people that lived in that town. And and, and, and uh, how many people are there today? Well, the mine shut, we've been shut down. Oh, this we, one. We, okay. we, we just sold it to yeah. another group called Golden yeah. Tag, so they're going to get it back up and running. Yeah. But during its peak, it had two thousand people in that town. Two thousand. Wow, really? Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know this, you know, the schools, you know, all these kids in you know uniforms, and you know, we we you know um, uh, built the schools, we put computers in the schools, we brought all the electrical infrastructure yeah. in town. All the internet infrastructure, yeah. all the water. Yeah, um, there was nothing. So fantastic. We yeah. built that town, paved all the streets, and yeah. uh, built the nice plaza for the community to to um, go to because you know plazas are a big thing in Mexico. They are. Yeah, uh, families get together every weekend and uh, hang out in these things. So we did all that, and uh, we had a movie theater, 
as well. We trained a bunch of uh, ladies on how to make coveralls for the mine. So they were, you know, doing our coverall Fantastic. construction. And uh, yeah, yeah it, it's pretty it, pretty interesting. And they, these kids are growing up. They they all their parents can now afford to send them to universities and colleges. Yeah, you know, and they previously wouldn't have had that that uh, yeah. opportunity. I love this kind of story. This yeah. is exactly why why I have guys like you on this on this uh, conversation on this podcast. But when I'm driving through the town, it's just sometimes they know who I am, and, and they I get the <laughs> odd wave and that now and then. So what do they call you? <laughs> I don't know. Gingro Keith. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> do you speak Spanish at all? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, Mexican government, how are they as far as working with them? Is it is it federally regulated? Is it is it a state system, or when you got to get your permitting, or or you know asking for you know permissions, that kind of thing? Um, you did mention it seems like a pretty mining friendly jurisdiction on sort of generalist terms, but how how has that been? Yeah, you need the local community to sign off. Uh huh. You know, and that that, that could mean a variety of different things because there is. Um, Indigenous um, uh, background or indigenous population that yeah. does you know live in Mexico. Yeah. So you know you have to deal with them, of course, and then yeah. have the proper land access agreements. And you know sometimes I could take time to get it together because yeah. often they're not very well educated, uh, and they often aren't structured. They often don't even have boards of directors. So often finding who to talk to is sometimes a challenge. Right. So you know you have to step them through that whole legal process. You know, forming a proper board, you know, forming committee. Really? You know, and, oh, yeah. And, wow. uh, and, and uh, so, when, and that could take some time. Yeah. You, you know, you're dealing with people that aren't used to that type of yeah, formality. Sure. Right. So you have to train them, bring the lawyers in and get them structured into a, a into a legal entity. Mm-hmm. And then once you can do that, then you start putting deals in place mm-hmm. and access, you start, you know, doing cost sharing, yeah. benefits and all those types of things. So. Um, that's step one. Then step two, you got to have this uh, the mayor and the government in town on site as well. So yeah. that'd be step two, and then you got to go to the uh, state government, and uh, then uh, that's when you get into all the environmental stuff and you know and, and more detailed type of um, uh, issues, and then you got to go federally, and then okay. yeah, because when you get explosive permits and things like that, uh, that's all run by the military. So you're right. all, you need the federal system in place to do. Okay. Wow, it's quite complex. Yeah. Do the um, do the Mexican cartels have any influence in this or any uh, challenges for a company like well, yours? We, we we don't really pay too much attention to them. So <laughs> well, hopefully know. they don't pay much attention to you either. You know, it's it's <laughs> it, you know I think there's just you know there's always a background, right? right? And it's just something that we don't I, I know pay attention to. Yeah, I I think you know there's been issues you know if if you know you're mexican and you're you know you knew who, you know who these people are you know you you just know not to you know bother with them i suppose yeah right it's just you know like you're not going to walk down to hastings and then uh go uh you know tap a hell's angel on the back right. and say hey you want to go for beer <laughs> right you know it's like you know, i guess it's the same type of thing right yeah so so no we uh but look they need us there yeah and and uh and, and they're part of the culture yeah. So a lot, a lot of people work work, you know, uh, uh, for the cartels there. Then they have good jobs and uh, and yeah. just part of the Mexican culture. Yeah. For yeah. us, we're just a foreign company. Right. You know, we're creating jobs, and and that's all we care about. Yeah. You know, we we want safe. Uh, we want everyone behind the gate to have a safe environment to work in. Yeah. And we want them to get home in one piece. Yeah. And and that's all we care about. Yeah. And of course, pulling metal out of the ground and hopefully making money at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but. Um, uh, you know how the cartels deal with the communities is not everybody our yeah. business. Yeah, so we don't well, too that's much well to said. I mean, it's a good, it's a good strategy. Make money and uh, and help out a local community and get these people back home and to their families. So that's good. Yeah, I want to pivot the conversation going back to where we first touched on, which is about government. You know, we have this uh, Trudeau government, hopefully for much not much longer. That's uh, <laughs> that's this here in Canada, and it's I just find the government narrative, whether it's the federal one or even provincially. Where they say, you know, we need to go to a green economy. We got to get, you know, we're going to go to carbon zero, net zero by 2030, 20, whatever, like whatever date they pick, it's not going to happen. I can guarantee you that. Yeah. Um, and yet at the same time, they vilify, in my opinion, they vilify companies and guys like you. They're like, you're a dirty miner, you're polluting the planet, you know, you're using all sorts of chemicals and energy to extract. Mm-hmm you know metal out of the ground but what they don't correlate is like 
how do you expect to drive an electric car, you know, or to run a house on a electric, you know, a heat pump system mm -hmm. if you don't have, you know, metals like copper and silver and what other metals? And I, I know you have a famous saying about copper and silver. What is that? Yeah, copper's the highway, silver's the glue. I love that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you said that they, to me a couple of weeks if ago. They think of a Tesla, for example, you know, yeah. how many batteries, 6,000 batteries on the in a Tesla. 6,000, yeah. And they're all connected by a little silver solder. Right. And so you got copper over the top yeah. and all connected with silver. Yeah. It's like pretty, pretty crazy. So what's your view on the government and this narrative that you keep hearing? Or do you, first of all, do you agree with me that you hear this narrative that like, <laughs> We have to well, go to green economy, but then they vilify guys like you. Is that do you have the same take as me? Well, energy is life. Yeah. Period. So without energy, we have no life. And and uh, and if you go back, you know, 120 years, go back to the late 1800s, you know, when you know uh, when the first automobile was you know for, uh, built, and 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 what's happened to the human race over that period of time, the advances that we've made is all oil based, right? right? Um, or virtually all oil based. And, you know, if we hadn't converted to an old, old, uh, old base economy back in the late 1800s, we wouldn't be here today. Exactly. Right. So, uh, you, you could, you could point your fingers at, at, at the humans and say, well, you fucked up. You should have gone nuclear. You should have gone hydrogen. Yeah. But we didn't. No. All right. We no, went, well, we, I we, mean, we, we wouldn't have had the technology in 1885 yeah. or 1882 yeah. to, you know, to, to do that. Anyways. To do that. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, you know, Humans are extremely innovative, and this whole uh, population uh, argument about there's too many people on the planet is just a bunch of fucking bullshit. Yeah. Um, there, you know, the reason why we can feed the amount of people that we have on the planet, right, and the reason why we could feed a lot more, uh, even if the population doubled, which I don't think it will, because you know by 2050 all the baby boomers will be dying. So, human population is going to go down naturally, anyways without any interve interventions by government. But even if it didn't occur, even if the human race continually uh, um, uh, grew at the same type of pace that we saw over the last 100 years, um, it, without oil and gas, you know, forget it. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, we need that oil to, to feed the population. Yeah. And yeah. that's why our food prices are so cheap. That's why everything's so cheap. Yeah. Because oil and gas. Our biggest problem, you know, and we had a guest on, uh, David Long from the Vancouver Food Bank. Now, of course, he's very local in his in his sort of world. But the biggest problem he says we have is food distribution, not food mm -hmm. production. You know, it's actually getting yeah. the food from one part, uh, one place to the location to another. Yeah. But going back to this narrative of this government and what you hear when you hear these, these you know, sort of like what I call like globalist governments that... Uh, you know, want to make it sound like we should somehow be able to go to a renewable energy system without having to do any mining. Can mm -hmm. that be done? No, no, no. We'll, you know, we ultimately will be mining our waste dumps, right? Because there's a lot of stuff in waste dumps that have been put there over the years and, uh, you know, refrigerators and yeah. televisions. I've often wondered about that. Yeah. yeah. And then there's scores of metal, you know, uh, that eventually at some point, uh, metal prices will be high enough to make it economic to actually start going and then, you know, going into our waste dumps. But mm -hmm. this right now, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. You know, to, to, you know, to take, you know, the silver out of this thing would cost you a fortune. Right. It would cost you more than the value of the silver. Right. right? So uh, at $100 silver, would it make sense to recycle that phone? Maybe. Right. You know, but not, not at current metal prices. Yeah. Yeah. Um, in your view, um, are we going to get to uh, net carbon zero by 2030? No way. No. Yeah, it's like yeah. even by 2050. Yeah. No, because like it, it took, uh, it'll take likely 100 years. Um, uh, and you would need also all the politicians on the planet to all agree on a strategy. And right now there's so many different diverge, um, you know, diverging governments around the world. They all don't really have a clue. They got all their fingers up their butt and uh, mm -hmm. all listening to Klaus Schwab and uh you know, all these, um, you know, crazy billionaires. World World Economic Forum. Yeah. yeah. I, I call this sort of genre of people the, the globalists out there. Yeah. I just uh, have some kind of global agenda. Yeah, I don't know what happens when you be, you know, I, I'm not a billionaire, you know, yeah. and, you know, maybe if I ever do become a billionaire, maybe my brain will change or something <laughs> and become a freak. But uh, you seem like most billionaires are just freaks. Yeah. <laughs> I think Elon Musk is probably the only one out there that's got any kind of co common sense. You like Elon Musk? I do, yeah. Yeah, me too. Yeah. yeah. What do you like about him? You know, he's just done so much. 
Yeah. Like, you know, I don't know, like, you'd have to go back to, you know, Ford or, or uh, you know, maybe Howard Hughes. Or, I don't know. You'd have to, there's not too many people in yeah. the world that has done as much as he's done. Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, he's partly Canadian too. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. What do you think of Trudeau? <laughs> <laughs> if we weren't being recorded. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you have a different opinion on, do you, do you like Pierre Polyev? I do. Yeah. 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 I just, yeah, look, I, I, I'm a libertarian. Yeah. You know, and, uh, um, and, you know, being a libertarian, I, I, I don't think government should be meddling in, in our yeah. life. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and our kids go to the same school and, and, uh, you know, it, it frustrates me sometimes where I see, you know, the schools trying to get involved in, in things I don't think they should personally get involved in. Yeah. Um, and, and this goes right up to the provincial government and right up to the federal government. Yeah. You know, they're, they're getting their marching you know, uh, instructions, you know, right from the top. Yeah. And it's a very socialist, uh, uh, you know, left wing, I suppose you can call yeah. it, but it's just, um, you know, it's, it's anti people yeah. and it's pro large government. Yeah. And I'm completely on the other side of that equation. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, one of the, we, Coastal Front has two parts of our, of our business model. One is we interview uh, guests like yourself for these podcast interviews. And the other part is where, uh, we do investigative journalism, like Reed's doing for us and doing a great job. And, you know, I, I did a report myself on um, the World Bank, and um, Canada has been giving the World Bank just over $500 million a year, Canadian, of our tax dollars every single year for decades. I mean, this, is, this, this transcends just the Trudeau government. This goes back to Harper, and it goes back. And this, to me, this is the, the globalist agenda of these politicians, and that's why I don't even look at it as like they're liberals or they're conservatives because they both have the same agenda. You know, when I look at the amount of money that we give to the World Bank, I ran the math because they, they're such a huge institution. There's so many people in suits living in New York City working for the World Bank that our tax dollars, $500 million that goes towards that institution every year, mm -hmm. covers the first, I think it's, I, my math was like the first six weeks of, of wages for the entire year. Um, so yeah, as they drink champagne and eat caviar, right? Exactly. Our dime. Yeah, exactly. Um, so I, like yourself, I would put myself in this category of libertarian. Um, and it'd be nice to be able to have these governments kind of step away and uh, out of, uh, out of our business. Mm -hmm. Um, do you, um, do you have any view on, on, uh, you know, like, is there, are there jurisdictions in the world that you would like to see more mining activity happen, but it doesn't because of, you know, government intervention? Like, well, I think Canada for yeah. sure. Um, cause you know, Canada is still, you know, a safe country. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I mean, safe legally. Uh, right. And, and from a county like property ownership rights. Yeah. 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 Our rights are still quite solid. And, yeah. uh, and also from an investor's point of view, it's, it's easy to do due diligence. You know, we're, we're, we're blessed with, uh, pretty good financial system in Canada. You know, we've got, uh, you know, if you're a foreign investor living in, you know, London, England, and you want to do due diligence on the Canadian pub co, you know, it's quite easy. Yeah. You own to CR, it's all there. And, uh, yeah. you know, uh, um, Edgar's a pain in the ass to use. Um, I'm yeah. not sure if you've ever used it, but, you know, compare, you know, our, our system c compared to the U.S. system, it's much more transparent. I haven't used it on your side. I've used it as a view on the user side, and I find that uh, Edgar, Edgar, was not as good as Cedar, but Cedar is terrible now. They've launched this new version. And it's just yeah, like it's brutal. I know. I, yeah. I don't know why. But the regulators in Canada, in my opinion, are just like they're. Well, they can get me started, but they're. I mean, whether it's CRA or it's like OSC or now that it was the new version called Ciro, which used to be IROC. Yeah. I mean, I just feel like they're they're overrun. Yeah, too many bureaucrats. Yeah, you're, you're you're right to that degree. But it all it all happened as a result of the crash, right? Yeah. So, so when the Canadian banks were allowed to go in and gobble up the brokerage firms, yeah, you know, Canaccord, you know, remained independent. But yeah, but you know, you know first marathons, just, yeah, you know, Wall and Stodgels, the you know, all, you know, McLeod Young Weir, Richard and Gary Shields, all these guys just got bought up. Yeah. Right. And uh, and that changed the system quite a lot. And yeah, it's uh, actually really unfortunate in my yeah, opinion. Yeah. It's and I, I don't get how. Like only twenty five percent of of the volume that trades in in Canada shows up on a regular you know TSX you know ticker right because uh, they've got all these black boxes and uh, you know the the banks or they're not the banks but the governments have allowed the banks to create all these other exchanges yeah. that are invisible to us right and we don't see them which is, I think is uh, very unfortunate. 
Yeah, I mean, my view is that the banking system in Canada is a, it's a real problem. It's it's unfortunate for the average Canadian doesn't realize. You know, we have this love hate relationship. You know, most people you talk to, like, oh, who do you bank with? Oh, I've been with Bank of Montreal for the last thirty five years. Mm-hmm. And, but at the same time, they're raking you over the coals, and every single fee they charge, they've completely consolidated the entire banking industry in every aspect. I mean, these six mm-hmm. banks now in Canada pretty much control the entire industry. And they have a f- major foothold on what's going on in policy and the government as well. Mm-hmm. Like, is my in my mind, they're they're hand in hand. I mean, these guys probably write big checks to these both conservative and liberal governments, and they have a lot of control, which makes sense because if I was a banker, if I was the head of CIBC or RBC or TD Bank, mm-hmm. yeah, I don't want to lose any of my market share. I yeah. mean, it's incredible. And you know, if you if you look in Canada, like we do a lot of business with with uh, with credit unions, and one of the reasons we do is. Credit unions are what I described as banks used to be 150 years ago. Real simple. Mm. They took deposits from real, you know, sort of depositors and they lent out on mortgages and that was it. And all the other fancy activities that these big banks do, um, foreign operations, doesn't exist. You know, we have not had a newly formed credit union in Canada in something like over 40 years. Mm. And they they used to be like, you grew up in North Vancouver. I mean, you have uh, with now Blue Shore, which is one of our favorite um, credit unions, they were started in, uh, I think it was like 1940s, where like uh, a few, like five people came together in, uh, in a meeting down at the docks in North Vancouver with a dollar each to kind of like fund this new credit union. Mm-hmm. Now you have to come up with, I think it's like $10 million of working capital just to get it off the ground. Well, who's going to walk into a, you know, into a meeting with $10 million bucks to say, hey, let's start up a new credit union? You know? So the, bank, the banks are controlling everything, in my opinion. We're a world of oligopolies here in Canada. I don't know if you see it the same way or not. Well, do you want the banks to control things or the politicians? I, I'm not sure who's, who could be worse. But. <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't know. Um, what do you think about the concept of space mining? Yeah, it's not going to happen in our lifetime. No. No. It's like we, we're not even mining our own oceans yet. Right. Um, you know, and, and, and ocean mining is complicated. So what are we talking about? Underground ocean mining? Is that what you're talking about? Well, e- e- even just on the, on the surface of the ocean floor. You know, there's there's accumulates of metal that have been accumulating for millions of years, mm-hmm. and it's it's all um, very accessible. It's mm-hmm. there, if, if but you know, governments and you know, like I'm not a fan of ocean mining. I, I would not, I, you know, if it was me, I would say forget ocean mining. Yeah, you know, I think our oceans are under attack, and uh, you know, we should be doing a lot more to try to try to save our oceans and preserve the life in those oceans. So yeah. I wouldn't support mining in oceans, but. Um, I'm just looking at it from a complete cost perspective. Yeah. Um, you know, the cost associated with uh, mining in the oceans is very, very high. That's why it's never happened. No one's pushed it hard enough because yeah. it's not economic. Um, so I'm not sure how you would mine on an asteroid. Yeah. How how that could be economic? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have some have to have some pretty fancy spaceships. <laughs> yeah, you would have to. Maybe maybe Elon will. Elon will come up with uh, something like that. He'll build one. Keith, you guys have a really neat. Um, I'm sure this is not core to your business at all, but it's a neat little um, business you've created of, of allowing your your shareholders and, and maybe even some outside customers to buy uh, blocks of silver directly from you. Mm-hmm. Can, can you talk a little about, more about that? I think people would find this really interesting. Yeah, I just came back from Las Vegas yesterday. Yeah. Um, um, so we've been producing uh, retail silver products since 2008. Okay, uh, and and uh, it was just started as a bit of a gimmick, more yeah. than anything. You know, and uh, and and so we just shipped our dory bars up from Mexico to the refinery in uh, the United States. From there, we just ship it to a third party mint, you know, Sunshine or Scottsdale or whatever mint we are you're using at the time. Um, um, uh, and then we would produce these products, and we have e commerce website and and so on and so forth. Over the last couple of years, the business has really taken off. Uh, and, and there's a, there's a real bottleneck within the mints, uh, and they can't produce any more metal. They're all at the end of their, and no one's making the investment. No one wants to expand them, uh, because the, the, the difference between a mint and a mining company is we don't have to go buy the metal. We just take it out of the ground. Yeah. A mint, if you're a customer uh, of the mint and you want to go buy, you know, a, a stack of one ounce rounds from your local mint, they have to go and buy that silver. And, I see, and then they stamp it with a whatever design you want on it. Yeah, and then and there's so there's a risk there. So uh, the mint takes time risk and price risk, and then you know of course sales risk. Right. So so there's been a number of mints that have gone bankrupt over the last you know decade 
in the United States because, you know, the owners would go and hedge their metal and then, uh, you know, markets taking off, their sales started taking off, they're getting excited. So they started going buy more and more metal. Every time they go buy more metal, they got to go into the market and hedge it. And all of a sudden the metal changes course, it collapses, which we often see, and the mint goes bankrupt. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in our case, we built our own mint. And, Did you really? Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's it's in Nevada. It's in Nevada. It's yeah. it's just in Las Vegas. So we uh, we looked at a variety of different jurisdictions around the United States. We wanted it in the U.S. because most of our customers in the United States, about fifty percent of our customers are actually Americans. So we um, and then we looked around best jurisdictions. So it's just got a big international airport. A lot yeah. of people are moving to Nevada right now from elsewhere. So there's a good workforce there, good talented workforce, reasonably reasonable costs you know, reasonable taxes and we figured, okay, whatever. So yeah, we built this mint and uh, it'll, we will be, I was just there yesterday and we'll be doing our first uh, products in January. Really? Yeah. So what are they going to be? Can we little, give us a little hint? Well, the it? original ones are going to be five, t- uh, five ounce, 10 ounce and one kilo bars. Okay. Yeah. But the most exciting thing customer, is our, yeah. re- our revenues are going to go up about three to 400% as a result of the mint because we know because of our own demand that we get, where we could doubt and uh, quadruple our sales basically overnight. So it is going to be actually quite material. Yeah. Yeah. It'll, we'll, we'll probably do, we're expecting 40 to 50 million in revenue in, in 2024. From just your direct to retail yeah, cut. Just, just that and one. And is it, yeah. is it just available to Americans or like as a Canadian? No. Could I? Yeah. yeah. Uh, just on our e-commerce website. So they, so. where do they go? Yeah. There's a little plug for you here. Where do they go? What do you mean? Uh, uh, on your uh, website. Like, they just go to oh, just First go to Majestic first, yeah, just, and yeah, first there's like a buy uh, button. and yeah, just, there's a little uh, silver button on the top and just click it and away you go. Wow. So, so. But we sell 100 ounce bars is the biggest. We sell 50 ounce bars and all kinds of other products as well. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So that's pretty, that's pretty really fun. neat. Keith, let's talk of, uh, uh, talk a little bit about some of the other companies that you have recently um, launched or been involved with. Snowline Gold is one of them. Mm-hmm. Can you tell yeah. us a little bit about Snowline Gold? You know, every once in a while, you know, I, I, I love I love helping entrepreneurs, and um, um, I, and, and of course, being in mining, I, I know mining quite well. So, you know, every now and then, you know, I come up with an idea and, and uh, uh, run into the right people, and and uh, if if um, it all stars align, I'll, I'll help them out. And in the case of Scott Burdell and his dad, Ron. Uh, I met them a couple of years ago at the PDAC of all places at the big uh, mining conference yeah. in Toronto, and uh, saw their core. and uh, um, I quite like Scott, and uh, um, he was you know trying to raise money and, and and you know get his company public, and so I decided um, to do a deal with him, and uh, so he spun or the family spun out their gold assets into a, a, a shell company, yeah. which, which we, we we named Snowline Gold. And where's the asset based? It's in the Yukon. Okay. Yeah, it's got, uh, well, I had helicopters in the air in August of uh, 2000, you know, right during COVID. And because uh, uh, over the time, over time, the Burdells had lost a lot of their land package because it was just simply too expensive to hold on to. Okay. So I financed um, a couple of helicopters to go up in the air and start staking. So by the time we got public, I think we had about 55,000 hectares of, of land staked. Uh, that was in April of uh, 2001, and then today they've got about 300,000. Oh wow, hect- hectares. Okay, yeah. have they done any drilling at this point? Oh, tons. Yeah, tons. Oh, okay. it's. Uh, oh yeah, it, it's. What's the? Know, what's I, the I'm not a geologist, but yeah. you know the people I listen to um, uh, and respect, you know, say that it could be the largest gold discovery in North America in our lifetime. Wow. Yeah. What's the trading symbol? S G D. S G D. Sam George uh, Dog. Okay, and what's it uh, what's it trading at right right now? About? Uh, I think about four fifty okay. in that range. It's got yeah, eight hundred million dollar market cap. Yeah, wow. So it's not right. small. Yeah, no, that's not small. No, but it's uh, like it, it, if it's as big as you know people think it is, it's you know going to go a lot higher. Wow, well, you know, time will tell. It's very yeah. risky. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know, I'm not yeah. making financial. Advice yeah, no, just, just we're just just yeah. letting people yeah. at least know that it's available. Yeah. Um, these, and then, these, these exploration stocks can be yeah. pretty challenging. Uh, you also have another company that you're also. First mining gold. Yes, that's it. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. We just raised some more money. Uh, I just put another million bucks into that company. I, 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 I'm the chairman. Yeah, founded that company in 2015. Um, I own like a lot, 28 million shares, something yeah. like that. And um, but it's two, two very large gold assets. One in Ontario, one in Quebec. Um, it's the only 
development or junior development company I know of that has two five million ounce gold projects, and uh, both will become mines, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, one is uh, in the permitting phase, the one in Ontario, Spring Pole, that's got another two years of permitting before cross our fingers that they can break ground and start building a mill. Um, and the other one is probably a few years after that. It's in okay. Quebec. But uh, the, well, I took the company public uh, back in 2014, 2015. We had a $600 million market cap. I raised quite a lot of money for it. Uh, today, the market cap is about $130 million. $130 billion. Million. Oh, million. Okay. So six hundred million. Yeah. Now, now it's one hundred thirty million. million. Okay. Yeah. So, but yeah. the the and it's been very de-risked. Yeah. Um. So it's a much healthier company today than it was, you know, when I first brought it public. Yeah. But this just goes to show you the yeah. market where it can go. Yeah. yeah. It's like you know, development assets are boring. You know, at least you know, my IR people tell me, don't ever say that. <laughs> it's not boring. It's super exciting. <laughs> but but. Uh, uh, you know, it, it can take a while. Permitting yeah. takes a while. And uh, so investors sometimes just, you know, ignore it and they'll come back later. Yeah, yeah. We'll see, we'll see what happens. Well, Keith, this has been a fascinating conversation going from a young guy growing up in, with a single mom and two brothers in North Vancouver, working at Loomis in a warehouse to being uh, <laughs> a, 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 at least locally, a very well-known mining entrepreneur. Um, it just goes to show you that if you... Uh, if you you know reach for your goals and dreams and just keep working, I'm I mean I'm, I'm sure if we had long more time, you could tell me about some challenges you went through. But if there was one sort of thing that you could pick out of your long history of in your career, a point in your life where you're like, man, this is this is tough, and maybe it was this morning. I don't know <laughs> what was. Can you pick a point out in your life where you can kind of inspire people listening to this conversation today that, that uh, you know don't give up? You know, it, it's, you know, I, there's, when I was quite young, I was 12 years old, I said, I've got have to be a millionaire. And so I made, I made that uh, goal at that time. Yeah. And I, then I figured, well, how the heck am I going to do it? Right. Cause I had, cause I had no clue. So, so, uh, um, I started writing down goals on a piece of paper. So I'd always have, you know, my goals listed, you know, in my bathroom counter, they'd be there, you know, three, four, five goals. I changed them over time, and um, every day I just looked at the goals. So I visualized what my future looked like, and I was also very curious. And I think you know some, uh, you know, peop you know, it's, it's interesting when I listen to successful people. Well, you know, what what is that one trait that makes a person successful? I think it's curiosity. Yeah, I think without curiosity, you know, there's really not much, right? Yeah. So if you're curious and you work hard, of course you got to work hard. Yeah. And you got to be stubborn as all heck as well, because <laughs> you can't let people knock you off your game because of your own people are always trying to do that. Right. So, um, but curiosity is key. Yeah. Great. Well, that's good advice. Yeah. Keith Newmeyer, first Majestic Silver founder and, uh, and CEO. Thank you for being on Coastal Front today and hoping for lots of success going into 2024. Thank you, Keith.